Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the final installment of the 2014 Spring Food for Thought Lecture Series here at the Whaling Museum. If you haven't already, please take this time now to silence your cell phones as to not to disrupt today's presentation. We thank you, as always, for supporting this free community program, which is made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation. And just so you all know, I know we're very sad that the spring series is ending today, but just to keep it in, your, in mind and on your calendars, the fall series will be starting October 16th. So hopefully we'll see you all back here this fall. All right, so we have with us today our Director of Historic Properties, Mark Avery. Mark arrived on the island almost 30 years ago to work for an architectural firm, and over time he came to realize that he was more interested in the preservation of what was already here rather than designing new homes. He found his calling in 2008 when he joined the NHA as the Director of Historic Properties. He's responsible for the care of over 20 historic sites, including the Whaling Museum. In honor of National Preservation Month, he will give us an inside look at the process of restoring one of the NHA's iconic historic sites, the Old Jail. Uh, there's an entire calendar of events for Preservation Month that Nantucket Preservation Trust is sponsoring. We do have some of them up here, and we also have some at the desk when you leave, so you can make sure to grab one of those so you don't miss any of these exciting events this May. So everybody, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mark Avery. Hello. I'm glad to see everybody out here. It's another terrible day. The groundhog lied. We will never get over winter. Um, but uh, indeed, this is the last brown bag of the, of the season, and um, it is also May 1st, which is the kickoff of Preservation Month. Um, this is the first uh, event of it. There is a real kickoff event tonight at the Dreamland, but uh, this is the first event anyway. So thanks all for coming along. Um, so what I wanted to start off with today is to talk a little bit about how our process works with historic buildings, how we uh, determine um, priorities, and um, what makes this year special is that the old jail has been um, a focus for us this year, and um, this summer it will be renewed and uh, will be a, 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 a very interesting place um, to go and see with new interpretations, new access that it has not had in many years. Uh, it'll have an interpretive sh uh, kiosk shed so that people who cannot get up into the jail, because it is difficult, um, can also see uh, many of the um, interpretive panels that we have there and so forth. So, so it'll be a, a, an enriched experience this summer. But currently, um, we are still working, uh, and we will be working right up until deadlines um, on, on the project. So, so um, the way uh, we have been doing things here at the NHA is we try to identify each season which projects are the most important to do out of our as Lindsay said, over 20 pro properties. Um, those are not all buildings. Some of them are just empty space, but, uh, and some of them are new buildings. But um, for the most part, these are all historic buildings, and they all require work every year. Uh, day in, day out, they deteriorate. So we have to come up with a priority list for these sites and how to protect them. Um, since I've been here, we have gone through uh, pretty regularly each season, identifying the highest priority properties that we have uh, and trying to target what we can do for that property. Uh, we will then try to get grant money, try to find funding sources for these restorations. Um, and, and we get a lot of help from various sources, which I'll go into later. But uh, this is how we end up prioritizing these, these uh, projects. And last year, uh, we came to the point where the old jail 
that had been sitting quietly on a rear lot on Vestal Street with very little activity um, for 15, 20 years uh, was in real need. Uh, the roof was starting to become um, holy <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the chimneys were starting to fail and, and many, many things. So we knew they were in, in desperate need. So um, this became the highest priority in, in, this, um, in this cycle. So um, we undertook um, to do that. Um, first, we uh, would go out, survey the building, look around it, see, in fact, what it is that we need to do to get this building back into shape. Um, as we discussed it, we not only thought we should take care of the specific problems that the building has, but also sh we should attempt to do as much restoration true restoration of the building as we can to bring it back up to some of the um, standards that it used to be, that, uh, that it could be a real show place, a real good museum site. So, so that was the attempt here. So uh, I'm going to go through a little bit our process in doing that, and I'll show you some pretty slides, some not so pretty slides, and uh, you'll be able to uh, walk, walk through the process with us a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, the old jail site. Um, this site is found on a very small alley um, off of Vestal Street. The actual address is 15R Vestal Street. Vestal Street, if you all, probably all know, is the street that the Mariah Mitchell Association campus is on. Um, this is down towards the opposite end of the street. Uh, closer into the Quaker Cemetery. Um, this was, uh, in the early days, kind of the edge of the historic village. Um, and you can always tell that by whenever you run into a cemetery, you're at the edge of the original village. Um, so the, the Friends Cemetery right there on what was called Grave Street in this map at the time, uh, now known as Quaker Road, um, the jail location back there um, seems like an odd place, but in fact Main Street um, was the home to many of the town's official buildings in the early days when the town first set up um, in closer in to the Great Harbor as opposed to being out sort of in the agrarian areas known as Old Sherburn. Uh, so the, the location was essentially the backside of all of the um, town uh, buildings, essentially. Um, here you can see the jail just south of Main Street um, uh, to the right of what is the Friends Cemetery. Uh, and that is the location where it was built in 1805. Um, there was deep concern that the previous jail was not able to hold inmates properly. People seemed to keep getting out. So they decided in 1805 to build a new jail. Um, this jail was built like no other building had been on Nantucket before. It is built more in um, what is um, uh, log cabin style, if you will, a stacked log construction. Um, and uh, unlike any other timber frame, standard timber frame that, that exists uh, around the island. Um, this is uh, an early photo of the jail, which is the small building on the left, and then the, the later House of Corrections, which was built next to it. The House of Corrections was moved in from Quays in 1854, 1855 period, uh, along when our island home was moved in from Quays. Um, these made up buildings from the old asylum out there. Uh, and uh, this was erected right there next to the jail, as you can see. That wasn't a maximum security kind of a building. It was more for debtors, perhaps indigent people, that sort of thing, but uh, it was um, a little bit more spacious, as you can see from the 
early photograph. Um, but uh, it lasted there for about 100 years, and then the, um, the House of Corrections was torn down. Um, but the jail remains. Uh, here's another photograph. Um, obviously, now the jail is in the backyards of others. Uh, the, er the first jailer's house was directly in front of, of the jail on Vestal Street at one point as well. Um, but here you can see it is clearly uh, already subjugated to the backyards of folks. And it's hard to imagine what they must have thought living right directly in front of the jailhouse there. I, I wonder. Um, this, is a, this is a view from the Main Street side, which would have been the side um, uh, that the, the, um, the, town, uh, the, the town buildings would have been on, on this side of the buildings. Um, and as you can see, the site had uh, large fences around it. It was, it was, cons it was the, the yard, I guess, uh, it, where uh, perhaps inmates were let out to be, uh, to, to have some fresh air, that sort of thing. Um, um, this is a, a photograph of, of an event there from the 1890s. Um, you can see that the jail is in pretty good nick here. Um, a lot of gentlemen dressed finely standing in front. So, uh, do you know what the uh, the prison commission? Yeah, thanks, Betsy. Thanks. The prison commission visits. So, um, yeah, these are these are just wonderful old photos that uh, I I I just can't help but share. Um, so the building, as I mentioned, was built in a style that is more reminiscent of some early um, Massachusetts Bay Colony buildings uh, called garrisons. These buildings were often built on what was the frontier of the the time, um, and they are of this stacked log construction, very solid. Um, many of them were built around the areas of the Merrimack Valley and the Piscataqua River in New Hampshire, which is where most of the early settlers and families that of Nantucket were from. So I presume the tradition of building something like this came from there. Um, log construction is, is done by various immigrants around America when, in the early days of colonization. The Swedes, the Germans brought a lot of uh, log construction like this with them, but the English generally only did it for this sort of garrison style house. This was a fortified house, essentially. So in case of attack by um, whoever might be attacking, uh, the, uh, they, they, were, they were fortified. They were able to go in there, have some amount of protection. Uh, there's a famous, there was a famous um, massacre. They call it the Oyster Bay Massacre in New Hampshire in the 1690s, 1692, where um, um, Huron Indians, with the, with the help of the French, came down from Canada and attacked the northern edge of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and after that, um, the people up there started building these garrisons uh, all along that edge um, to protect themselves. So our jail is built kind of in a similar vein. Uh, small windows, log construction, neatly dressed on the corners. Um, the logs are generally squared off, debarked, um, but left pretty much, um, pretty much intact, just can hewn. Uh, they are built. The, it, the whole thing is built of oak, white oak, uh, the colonist choice, um, the best, the best building material the English and the early colonists ever found. So we have. Um, gone into these walls recently um, to see some of this construction and indeed the joinery is pretty remarkable for a utilitarian building. Um, the NHA acquired the old jail in 1946 after the town no longer had a use for it, but um, some of the earliest Habs drawings um, were done uh, in America. Um, and, 
of places like the jail and these Habs drawings, I'll tell you what Habs is in a minute if you don't know, uh, 1935. So we have a wonderful document that shows, uh, and it's a whole set of plans of all the details of the building as it existed in 1935, which was before the NHA ever took possession of it. Um, so we have wonderful, wonderful documentation of the building. Habs is a, a, uh, a historic American building survey that was um, started um, in, the, in the 1930s um, as a WPA project to document America's history uh, and its historic buildings. The, and um, Habs uh, began just identifying key important structures throughout the country and began documenting them for the Library of Congress. And our jail happens to be one of the first early sets, which is great. Um, so as you can see from these plans, um, there, you know, there is very little difference to what you see on the jail now than what we did then. Um, and the jail, it, uh, it, it was uh, given to the NHA in 1946, as I said, right after the war. Uh, it had been generally only used as sort of storage for a number of years before that anyway. Um, so it, uh, it came to the NHA and the NHA endeavored to put it back in shape. Um, one of the things they did, um, reshingled the entire building, um, put the, uh, the, the door mechanisms in working order and tried to essentially just clean it up. Um, added a few accoutrements like new uh, bunks in each cell, um, but but that's about it. Um, this this um, this jail you can see is a very small, my kind of a, uh, a, a, a almost a shed. <laughs> it is four it is four cells. It is um, when you walk in the front door there are, there's a cell on either side. Upstairs the same arrangement a cell on either side. And in going through it we realized that the the jail kind of had different levels of security in each cell. There was a uh, penthouse suite up on the west side on the second floor. There was a maximum security cell on the, on the east side on the first floor. Um, you can tell this in a number of ways. Um, the windows were of different sizes. Um, more light makes those rooms remarkably different. Uh, the less light makes them very cold and very um, uh, very uncomfortable, um, and uh, in that in the what the the cell that we consider the maximum security one, not only are you surrounded by uh, oak logs, but those oak logs are pierced by iron bar that runs completely through them under the floor, uh, up the walls, across the ceiling. Uh, all embedded in the oak timbers. So even if the timbers weren't there, you were in an iron cage and there's no escape. And in fact, when in doing work recently, we have found um, some of the iron bars that uh, run underneath the floor, which we didn't even realize were that extensive. So, so again, here's another, another view of the... Um, of the jail from the backyards, um, but this is um, this is in the 1940s, I believe, when um, both of the buildings, the jail and the House of Corrections, were in pretty good shape. And you can see in this photograph that, in fact, it looks like the House of Corrections has just gotten a new shingle job and new trim. But as everything goes, um, things start to deteriorate over time. Um, the NHA, um, without uh, investing too much money in the property, as it is one of many that uh, require work, um, started to deteriorate a bit more. Uh, and another um, um, attempt at some of the restoration work was done in the 60s, uh, a small amount, just areas that needed needed work. Um, but uh, it 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 generally just hadn't gotten a full 
a, a lot of full work um, in, in quite some time. Um, I didn't mention this before, but these, um, these, these little stock structures out in front of the jail, um, they were there for a number of years, um, placed there by the NHA when it became a museum, um, probably in the early 50s. And they lasted through, I think, about 1980, uh, perhaps the, late, the mid, mid or late 70s. Um, but um, they, there was no documentation that they were ever original. They were just a fun photo op, I believe, for, uh, for people to use. Maybe some of you remember actually taking photos in those stocks. I, I did not, but I, I think uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, it, is a, it is an interesting um, um, idea that, the, I, that um, when, when we talk about museum properties, how now we want to be as authentic as possible. In previous times, that wasn't always the case. Sometimes you would do things that were kind of um, not necessarily accurate or um, had any real basis in history, but just they were what you thought they might be. In fact, um, other NHA properties like the oldest house had mannequins uh, and spinning wheels and all sorts of things in them to demonstrate what life was like in the early days, but none of them had any real basis. In fact, they were just uh, accoutrements for, for the visitor. But now we take a more hard look at things and only want to do what's really authentic. So 1954, our uh, House of Corrections here is starting to get dismantled. Um, presumably it had deteriorated to the point where there was not really much salvage. So um, here you can see uh, men um, starting to take it apart bit by bit. So presumably, as with everything on Nantucket, is probably going to be reused in some way. Um, it probably had some wonderful old, uh, old timbers and, and, and planks. And as you can see, those two gentlemen there up on the second floor deck, they're holding a very pretty piece of wood. So I'm assuming that they used it all again somewhere, um, as is the tradition here. So uh, the 1950s, 60s, the jail kind of um, was a, an attraction, but um, an off-the-beaten-path attraction. Um, I forgot who the photograph is of somebody clowning around on that railing, but I uh, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Oh, always, always one in the crowd. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, the NHA staff, actually, I, I should say this. The NHA staff is so good to work with because we have so many different people that just pitch in and help out um, on anything. And every time I ask Ralph, Ralph, I'm giving a talk on this or that, immediately she sends a page and a half of photographs and tells, them, tells me the ones she prefers and tell me, tells me the history of the people in them and... It's, it's just such a resource, so always, always a pleasure to do that. And Betsy Tyler, of course, throws out wonderful anecdotes and hist historical notes that are just uh, so interesting every time, every time a project like this comes up. Um, so again, here we are um, in the uh, 70s, the, um, the or uh, I should say late 60s, um, and... Um, um, not much has changed. Um, again, some, some young criminals here. Um, and in 1970, um, there was a fire in the building. Uh, the fire um, actually was set. Um, many of the people at the time said it was hippies. Um, but... Um, there was a fire set at this site, and it was also there was also one set at the old windmill. Um, and indeed, the fire started on the second floor vestibule and went right up through the through the ceiling um, and through um, the roof, um, mainly on the south side, the front side of the building. But it took a it took a lot of uh, toll on the building. And the scorch marks are all still there. This is the ceiling of the second floor vestibule. You can see that all of these logs uh, have been scorched. Uh, they are still there, though, and they still tell a real story of the history. So we leave them, of course, um, 
Um, this is from the attic space, and right after that 1970 fire, you can see they have spliced in new sheathing onto the roof, but right adjacent to it in both directions, you can clearly see the, the, uh, the, fire, the fire damage up there in the attic roof system. Um, the problem is, of course, that even these, um, t these uh, planks for the, for the roof around the area were, were damaged um, to the point where when we went up into that space again for the first time in many years, um, that damage had gotten significantly worse, in part because now some moisture was getting through the roof into these old, already fire-damaged timber, uh, timbers and planks. Um, so, this is how we found the jail um, this, these last few years. Um, the cells have not had too much uh, work done to them in, in, in years. Uh, they are, have um, some significant remnants of the lime wash that they would treat the entire interiors of these cells with. Um, the iron has rusted, but um, it's, not, it's not in any danger of anything. Um, this is the accommodation here in each cell. It's, it's about a uh, 16 by 14 room, so it's fairly spacious. It's got a little privy box, as you can see right there. Um, inside that little wooden box is actually an iron cage as well, so you couldn't climb through there. Um, and there is a, um, is a pass-through into the vestibule uh, in that privy, so it was, they, they used a chamber pot, essentially that the, uh, the jailer or the lucky jailer's wife would have to change. So, uh, and, and the two bunks in the little nook, and what's not shown in the photograph the other direction was where the heat source was. There was a fireplace in two of the cells uh, on the west, and there was a, presumably a stove, and uh, a stove on the both upper and, and lower east cells. So uh, the, the more maximum security cells uh, had, had a stove, not a fireplace. Um, here is, here is the, um, the east cell on the first floor. Again, um, you can see the iron, the iron work that straps each and every wall of this, this space, including the interior walls, but it's beneath the, uh, the wood uh, planking in this case. Um, and so this, this is a, a, fairly, a fairly contemporary photo of what it has been looking like for a while. So we identified this as a project. Um, in looking at all of our properties, this one, um, we could see that there was water damage starting. There was definitely infiltration into the spaces. Um, the, the stairway had been off of the building for about 15 years. Um, it apparently had deteriorated to the point where it was removed for safety reasons. The second floor door um, had been removed as well. These doors are very double plank thick oak um, with iron in them. And that door had disappeared and we weren't sure where or why. However, um, and, and what's shown in this photograph is just a, a wooden panel that's over that doorway on the second floor. So um, we wanted to repair the roof. We wanted to um, rebuild that stairway so there is access onto that second floor. We wanted to re rebuild that doorway on the second floor. We needed to address all of the issues that we might find that rot had incurred and um, really stabilized the building from sinking into the ground anymore, uh, which is also a problem with it. So we um, did a complete survey of the building, figured out all of the items that we needed to repair and restore. Um, many of these items in a walkthrough um, with an engineer and with other experts on various um, trades and found that there was some significant rot in various corners of the building. This is a corner that was opened up to show how the ends of the logs at a corner um, looked. You can see that uh, in, in most of this instance, they look pretty good. But 
um, in some areas um, of deterioration. On the, on the left, this is a fireplace in the first floor cell that was in terrible shape in 1995. In 1996, um, uh, Master Mason Henry Varian, who recently passed away, um, rebuilt that fireplace uh, in the lower photo right there. Uh, also, the, this was another 96 repair. Uh, many of the windows had started to rot out from, um, from wa water infiltration, and those were repaired with new, new wood in many cases because the old was so gone. Um, this is a photograph that shows the extent of damage underneath the second floor door. Um, it was completely um, removed where the rot had, had, uh, had destroyed the timbers uh, and replaced with new wood. What we later found was the, the, these planks that replaced um, the missing wood were from our second floor door. <laughs> We found the ghosting of the old hinges on them, so we know, in fact, that's what they used the old door for. They used it to fix the area underneath the door. So, um, so in our survey um, uh, a, a year ago, um, we found several areas where we know water was getting in. Uh, the roof, you can see the roof has significant problems with the shingles, but also there are little hollows between each of the each of the boards, and that's a, sh uh, a sure indication that there is deterioration in each of the sheathing boards. And many of those sheathing boards were original boards, which means they were 22 inches wide, 24 inches wide, and um, the whole middle of them has kind of um, deteriorated out. You could see light through them, um, which is a, never a good sign. The, 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 the biggest part of any um, any successful uh, preservation effort is to keep water out. And as soon as you lose that, that shell, um, you have all sorts of problems. And so, indeed, we were finding that that was a problem here at the jail. The lower pictures are both pictures of the windows on the south side that um, deterioration has started on the timbers directly underneath each of those windows. So clearly water was coming through. So, um, the attic had not been accessible for quite some time, and since 1970, because the, uh, there is no access to it. The ceiling of the second floor is solid oak timbers. There is no access hatch. There was nothing on the roof to get you in there. There were chimneys on both ends of the gables, so there was no vent or anything into the attic from the ends. And so we made the call that we have to provide access to this attic in order to monitor how much uh, water damage might be coming in. So we went and cut a hole in the north side of the roof um, to get into the attic. Uh, and this, is, this, this was the first day we were up in the attic climbing around, myself, an engineer, uh, and our preservation architect, um, to really assess the damage up there. We found some significant damage in the sheathing on the south side, as was expected. Um, we found that flashing had been a problem around chimneys. We found, um, generally speaking, um, a lot of cobwebs. My hair was never so dirty. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think um, the ceiling of the, of the two cells below uh, were in good shape. We could see evidence of that 1970 fire everywhere, um, but generally speaking, the south roof was the biggest, uh, biggest concern for us because many of the sheathing boards that you can see on the left side of this image were, were um, an eighth of an inch thick at this point when they started out being an inch and a half thick. So, so um, the hole in the roof, by the way, um, is... Uh, part of a, what will be a permanent hatch to allow us in and out access to the attic. So not, not to worry, it, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't a hole just left in the roof. Um, here, here is that south side um, roof sheathing and you can just see it on the bottom of the image, you can see light coming through. Um, and on top of these sheathing boards there is tar paper 
and there was shingles, uh, asphalt shingles. Um, and so you, you still seeing light through there means, um, means very, very bad. So um, with, our, with our survey, we came up with real issues that we needed to address. First one was underpin the building. Um, this is a process where you dig out underneath the structure where it has weak points, put in concrete footings, and then um, shore up the building from those new concrete footings. So this is a plan that shows where we had problems with the building's footings. Uh, some of the images you may have seen, the, the building has become a bit saddle-shaped. It's got a bit of a curve to it. It's gentle, it's not too big a deal, but we just didn't want to, that to become any worse than it already is. The only problem with that saddle shape is that it funnels all the water that hits the building into the center, and then it goes right down the center of the building. So we do need it, we, so we're not gonna repair that saddle shape, we're just gonna stabilize the middle of the building so it can't continue to deteriorate. Uh, this is a, an image showing the south side elevation of the building and clearly showing the roof needing work. Um, this is a plan of uh, what we're going to do for the roof repair and the new hatch. Uh, and of course, a new detail for the stairway. We made an executive decision to go a little bit higher with the railing than the old one. The old one was only about two foot three high, which would hit most people at about just over the knee or mid thigh. And we thought that was a little unsafe. So we raised the railing height uh, in our new plan just to make it safer. Um, this is a, a plan of the new second floor door that we are rebuilding. We uh, networked with many people to find hardware that is original old hardware. We have found some wonderful old iron strap hinges that match perfectly and we have a couple of custom made pieces coming. Um, incidentally, there's one um, latch, the uh, lower one uh, up there it's called, it says strap on the plan. Um, apparently the NHA stole that strap off of the jail when the door went away, and it's now on the old windmill. <laughs> so I found it. I, I, when I was looking at the drawings, the old Habs drawings from 1935, I said, I've seen that strap somewhere. I know where it is, it's at the windmill. So, so um, with, with all the information we found, we continued to uh, go through the process of trying to find funding to make this repair. So first we went to our own community preservation committee, which has been very helpful uh, in the past on preservation matters with us. Uh, they give uh, a lot of funding to preservation programs on the island, and we applied um, for half the cost of what we thought this restoration would be. Um, they granted that. Uh, almost immediately, um, and so we were, we were part way there. Um, um, we have an in-house uh, grant writer, uh, Karen Lindsay, who uh, also was able to identify several other sources that we should go after. Um, we went to Mass Historical Commission to find matching funding from the Community Preservation Committee. Um, that is an exhaustive task to do, but we, uh, we put that uh, together and indeed were granted um, uh, 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 another half uh, from, from them. Um, that covered the construction costs, just like that. Uh, we also then went to um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation to get funding for our consultants. Um, because some, some grants are for bricks and mortar and some grants are for consultants. So we went for the National Trust for grants for consultants um, and, and received that. And then finally, uh, one grant that we had been disapproved for early on because we didn't have enough other funding was the DAR. And um, Karen reapplied the moment we had these other grants in place and the DIR came through with us and um, just, in fact, informed us that uh, we received that grant too. So in this process, we surveyed the building, got our plans together, went out for funding, and we're four for four for all the funding sources we tried. So we had the whole restoration fully covered um, by uh, both local, uh, state, and national funding sources, which is a real, uh, it's a textbook way to do a preservation project, I, I, I'd say, but 
um, a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work. In fact, uh, when we went to the Mass Historical Commission um, to receive um, their workshop when they gave us the grant, um, they fund 19 projects or thereabouts every year for the state. And uh, it was um, remarkable because most of these buildings are large city halls, stone, granite buildings, public spaces throughout the state. And um, in that workshop, the slide, show, the slide of the old jail came up and a room full of people just gasped. <laughs> they, they loved the jail so much. It was so unique to everything, everything else that they had seen. So, um, so it was very enthusiastic that they, they funded us. So our project, we started stripping immediately the shingles off. Once we were all set, um, we redid the roof. Um, it's continuing. Um, we started to take off those shingles to really see what was underneath. You can see that in this photo, there are several layers of sheathing that have been placed. This sheathing is not that old, actually. This sheathing is probably from the 1940s when the NHA took over the building. Um, and that overlays an older layer of sheathing that was, um, that was um, from the original construction. Um, we found that the first floor uh, in the vestibule had deteriorated pretty significantly. So, and you can see in the lower portion of the photo, many of the timbers that are sitting on the ground were starting to show signs of decay. So those are the areas we needed to clean up. This area right here is a patch uh, of an experiment for lime washing of an interior cell that um, was, was tried and it does appear to work. And so one of our goals here in this um, restoration is to put lime wash back in one of the cells, the penthouse suite, um, to see how it works. Uh, the rest of them we will leave as they are right now. Um, once we took the sheathing off, you can see on the lower portion of the, of the building, the newer sheathing, then you can see to the left in the middle, the older sheathing, and then be below that you can see the timbers and the extensive water damage that we found inside, uh, unfortunately. So um, we are replacing all of those old timbers that we have to, repairing the ones we can, uh, and then putting it all back together. I, uh, I, didn't want to, I, I didn't want to show you any final product photos yet because A, we're still working, and B, because I want you all to go up there this summer and have a look at the jail in its new preserved state with the new access to the second floor and the new presentation panels, and uh, we will have this site uh, with an interpreter on it this summer, which is something that the NHA hasn't had in many, many years. So that is... Um, that is my, my story, but uh, I want Betsy Tyler to come up here and talk a little bit about some of the history she's been doing uh, on the jail. She has some, uh, found some wonderful stories, <laughs> and um, I, she wants to share those with you, too. Thank you. Um, oh, good, I'm on. Um, I did want to share with you some of the human stories, some cautionary tales. Um, about the jail. Uh, one of them has to do with um, what Mark was calling the penthouse suite. I've named it the embezzler's suite um, because I've identified two embezzlers who spent time there. Um, the first one was Barker Burnell Jr., who embezzled money from the Manufacturers and Mechanics Bank in 1846 or 7, I think it was. Anyway, he... Um, he embezzled money, he was brought to trial, and he was acquitted. But the humiliation of the whole thing, and the fact that his records were such a mess, people couldn't really tell if he embezzled or not, um, so humiliated him that he and his family moved to South America. Um, that was unfortunate, but they lived in Chile the rest of their lives. Um, but this um, cell, or one like it on the top floor, is where another embezzler spent time uh, in 1883. His name was William H. Chadwick. There's another view of that lovely cell. This, we think, is William H. Chadwick. We recently scanned some glass plate negatives that we've had for a long time. 
Um, it was identified as W.H. Chadwick, and it's from the 1870s or 80s. William H. Chadwick, our William the Embezzler, was born in 1847, but there was another William H. Chadwick born in 1847 on Nantucket, which happens all the time. So we're not really sure which one, but I think this is the man because he's quite well-dressed, and uh, he was from a prosperous family. He was the bank cashier. And Chadwick um, was brought up to this jail in 1883 and um, introduced to his quarters for where he would spend five, a five-year sentence, um, which is hard to imagine. Uh, but his family lived nearby, and they supposedly furnished his cell for him with a rug and books, and he was able to make light ship baskets and spend his time there. Um, he, it was preferable to being sent to state prison, I'm sure, for him. Um, the money that he embezzled, $10,000 from the Pacific National Bank, um, was presumably used to purchase materials for this grand construction project he had out in Squam Head um, that's become known as Chadwick's Folly. And that is an amazing, or was an amazing place. We never, he never really divulged what he was doing, what this was all about. People thought maybe it was a summer hotel or a gentleman's club or a gambling casino. Um, and that off-island backers had funded this project. But when he was arrested, uh, the project was halted and the property was sold at auction. So it never really um, became what he envisioned, but it was quite a beautiful place. Uh, and as a felon, uh, he was incarcerated in the old jail rather than the House of Correction next door. But he was a model prisoner. And after three years, President Cleveland commuted his sentence, and he was able to be free. Um, another, I'm going to give you, I know we don't have much time left, but there's an, another cautionary tale here that I thought was kind of interesting. And we're, we're interpreting the jail, the various cells, to have a story of a person who spent time there. So we've identified some crimes and some criminals, and, and we're going to feature those in the jail. And one of them, who we will put in the upper right-hand cell, uh, was named Arthur Barely. And Arthur uh, was sentenced for a number of crimes over a number of years. Uh, he had a drinking problem. He um, was accused and sentenced for breaking and entering, for drunkenness, for larceny of a cat boat, and larceny of chickens. <laughs> he was just in trouble a lot. His father was a very well-respected shoemaker who later served on the Crossrip light ship and made baskets. And he had two brothers who were civil engineers who did really well in life. But he just constantly ran into trouble. And I'm going to read to you from the Inquirer Mirror, which, as we all know, is the best place to read about crime on Nantucket. Um, so July 25th, 1903. Arthur Barely, who a few months ago was released on probation from the state reformatory, where he was serving a sentence for stealing catboat Samoset and sailing her out of the harbor several years ago while in an intoxicated condition, has been up to his old tricks again and was before trial justice Moore's Friday week on complaint of John H. Dunham for a similar offense. I just happened, I couldn't find a picture of Arthur Barely. But here's some cat boats. I thought it was the Samo set, but I'm not sure that it is. But anyway, he liked cat boats, and he stole another one. And when fishermen were out early in the morning, they saw a boat um, acting strangely and found Arthur Barely there and brought him back to jail, and he was committed, uh, brought him to town. And it was his second offense. So he was committed to jail to await trial in October. So this is July. He has to be in jail three months to wait to go to court. In September, there's an article in the paper with a big heading, Fire at the Jail. And um, the story goes, as reported, uh, for a few moments late Thursday evening, Nantucket's famous landmark, the county jail, was threatened with destruction by fire. The solitary inmate, Arthur Barely, 
lit his pipe to enjoy a smoke about 11 o'clock and strolled out into the yard. He evidently dropped a spark. For a few minutes afterwards, the outside of the building caught fire and a lively little blaze was in progress. Um, Keeper Parker started out on his nightly round of duty at about the same time and noticing the blaze, hastily summoned assistance and extinguished the fire um, without alarming the town. The damage was slight. Now, I think the interesting thing here is that the prisoner had a pipe and matches, <laughs> and he was able to walk out into the yard for his smoke, which means his cell door wasn't locked, the main door wasn't locked, and nobody knew what he was up to. Um, anyway, before, before I leave you to ponder the consequences of a life of crime, um, I'm going to read um, a statement from the report of the prison commissioners in 1902, the state prisoner prison commissioners came to examine the jail. And they wrote, um, the buildings here remain as a curiosity in prison architecture. There was one prisoner in custody at the close of the year, the same as last year. During the year, the keeper reports that there was one prisoner for one day, one for three days, held to be transported to a prison on the mainland, and one held for 14 days awaiting trial. As far as the jail is concerned, there is very little criminal business in Nantucket. And then, uh, this commission did recommend over the years that the facility be not used, that it be destroyed, that it was unfit for human habitation, but the town continued to use it actually up until 1933. Um, but in 1914, the commission again reported the idea of Nantucket's ancient landmark ever being used as a haven for criminals struck the party as amusing. In fact, its value as a jail or place of detention was beyond consideration. <laughs> so I know we're, we're running late here. So do you have questions for either Mark or me? Hang on one second. We want to be sure we get you on tape. Do you know who the last prisoner was? Um, I do. I have my old jail notebook where I've got a lot of, of, of reports about prisoners, but it was 1933. I can't remember his name, but he actually escaped. He knocked the keeper over the head with a piece of loose mortar from one of the <laughs> decrepit fireplaces, knocked him over the head, and he escaped. Um, it was believed that his friends um, secreted him in a laundry basket and got him on the steamship somehow, and he was gone. But he was the last one. <laughs> Hold on, we'll be right here. <laughs> was five years the longest anyone ever stayed there? Um, I don't know, but I imagine it was. He was actually only there three years, but it was okay. mainly um, a holding pen for people who were awaiting trial. If there was a serious crime, they were sent to a state prison or you know, some other place. And does anyone know, did anybody, did they ever find out who um, set fires that year? Uh, no, I don't oh. believe they did. <laughs> Somebody seems to know. <laughs> this is information about the fire. Um, if it weren't for my husband, the jail would have burned down. For 25 years, we lived at 13 Bestel Street. Oh. And our property adjoined the jail property and so uh -huh. forth. And my husband had a curious way of going to sleep very early and then waking up and not being able to go to sleep. So he was in a back room upstairs at 13 Bestel Street reading. And he hears this crackling noise. Mm. And he looks out the window. I don't, it was maybe one or two in the morning. It was that time of night. Mm. And he saw the jail on fire. So he picked up the phone and took care of it. Wow. What year was that? 70. I don't remember. It was I 70. guess it was 1970. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Well, that's you. great information. Yeah. Now we have that on tape. That's wonderful. <laughs> yes, and will you if tell you us? would give your name. Will you tell us your name? What? What's your name? My name is Adrian McCauley. He was John McCauley. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have one more little comment to make, and that's about the Chadwick's Folly. I remember uh -huh. years ago when you would cross the Sound coming in on the steamer. Chadwick's Folly was one of the first things, beside the water tower, Chadwick's Folly was one of the first things that stuck up at the horizon. Oh. Mm. Amazing. So that there was, it was never finished inside. Yeah. Something about a stairway, I remember, mm. that never got finished. Yeah, I believe it was never finished as a building. Right. That's right. 
In so fact, um, the NHA just took donation of two massive uh, door roof brackets. They're just a little door hood that goes over, um, kind of over the front door, and these two amazingly carved brackets that held that up. And those two brackets just came into our collection. Mm -hmm. We believe they're from Chadwick's Folly. So that just happened uh, literally within the last month. The, All right, the cupola that actually was on top of that one building, the large building, was taken off and became a house of its own. It was that large. I think we have time for one more question over here, and then if anybody has additional questions, please feel free to come up and talk to Mark and Betsy after the presentation, and also come visit the jail this summer. Don't come yet, by the way. <laughs> give, it, give, give it a month. <laughs> this is just a comment. <clears throat> Years and years ago, I had some friends of Rickards that lived out at Chadwick's Folly. And Dutchie said to me one day, you want to have some fun? I said, doing what? <laughs> Let's climb up in Chadwick's Folly. The windows were all out. And <laughs> somehow or other, we managed to climb up to the Folly. It was a steep cliff that led down to the bank. And there was a man named Marshall Ferrier that lived in a nearby cottage. Dutchie said, uh-oh, here comes Marshall with his gun. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> we exited Marsh's uh, Chadwick's Folly, I'm not sure how, and we rolled down the bank and lay close, <laughs> close to the bank for about an hour to escape Marshall Ferry. <laughs> That's a great Thank story. you for sharing. Yeah. <coughs> All right, you. thank you everybody once again for coming to our last presentation this year. Please feel free to pick up one of the calendars for the rest of the Preservation Month activities, and hopefully we will see you all again this October for more exciting presentations. Thanks Thank for you. Coming out. Thank you.